We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio, episode 131B is the science episode, and we're going to break it down. We're recorded here Friday, November 4th, 2016. We're going to dismantle everything for you through for your edutainment. I've got David O'Connor, Stephen Griffith, and Amber Besucker. Okay, <clears throat> so, Amber. Yeah. You had, <laughs> you had something you really wanted to talk about. I did. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the, the male birth control study where, like, 20 participants walked out and they, they had to shut the study down. And I want to preface that mm -hmm. by saying that I did read the article that you posted talking about, um, I think it was called, like, we still don't have male birth control, but it's not because men are wimps. I read that. I read another article very similar to that talking about how one guy went in, he became infertile as a result of the birth control injections that they were testing. Mm -hmm. And so my rebuttal to that is this. If you look, no one, I don't think anyone who's actually read the study and who is familiar with the side effects is really making fun of men for feeling like it's like depression and pain and nausea is intolerable. Nobody should have to deal with that, ideally. Right. What's frustrating is that if you look back at the history of the pill for women, but we're talking about way worse side effects that still exist today because there hasn't been a ton of research done to fix any of that. Mm -hmm. um, symptoms <clears throat> like major depression and mood disorders that have been reported for literally decades that scientists and doctors, um, I mean, they put this in writing that the women were exaggerating or having psychosomatic symptoms, like these things weren't real. And it's only until this year in 2016 where we finally said, oh, no, they're right. They really do get depression from using the pill. Yeah. Um, three women died in the initial testing for the pill. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think anybody who has any kind of sense of, of ethics or anybody who's actually looked into the study at all is saying, like, oh, well, men are pussies because they wouldn't sit around and let this happen to them. The frustration is coming from the fact that this only had to happen to a very, uh, well, um, not very small, but a, a, well, the, a relatively the sample small size, portion was, was 300 sample? and something. 320 men who participated in the research reported a whopping 1,491 1, adverse events. And the researchers running the trial determined that 900 of these events were caused by the injectable contraceptive. Right. But the vast majority of what they reported was acne and the, the more serious side effects. Like I said, like the infertility, for example, was literally one. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's OK to, to find that intolerable, like the, the acne even, you, you know, whatever. But it's frustrating when that happens and immediately panels are like, oh, shut it down. Like, we can't. Nope, that's not OK. But we've, you know, women since the 60s, 60s have been dealing with this and worse. And it's not been addressed in any significant way. That's, yeah. I think, where the the frustration is coming from mm -hmm. and the disgust is coming from. And even some of, like, the laughing and, like, really um, because for decades we've been told either – we're wrong. This isn't actually happening to us. The side effects aren't real. It's all in our heads. We're being hysterical. Or where it is documented that these things exist, it's just like, well, you're just going to have to put up with it. I mean, yeah, it sucks, but that's okay. You know, it's it could be worse for you. So for for that trial to get shut down as a result of of this is frustrating. And, and I stand by that. I mean, I, again, ideally, nobody has these side effects. Nobody has to go through this. And depression is completely intolerable. I absolutely agree. But it's the double standard of treatment that is pissing women off. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Though the well, thing as, is, as a man, I'm going to call the men who shut down the study pussies. Uh, <laughs> well, or wusses, <clears throat> we'll say. Uh, also, most of the uh, uh, the birth control that's out on the market now, you know, for women, was put into play when there were not quite as rigorous standards for science. Right, and, and they, and they the still testing. deal with a lot of those side effects today. Yeah, yeah exactly. they do. And there are women who become infertile as a, as a result yeah, of their birth absolutely. control. So, I mean, if it's not okay for a study of men, why is it okay for all women? Yeah, who are out of the study phase. But there's also a lot of different ones for women as well. So they can change out. We're looking at, what, one right now for men? That's true. Yes, and however, hormonal birth control is, mm -hmm. is very similar, as far as side effects go, almost all across the board. Yeah. And, I mean, we're also talking about a risk of stroke and a heart attack. Um, you know, life-threatening oh, yeah. events. Um for pretty much any brand, even the injectable, um, which the name uh, Depro, Depo Provera. Yeah. Um, even with Nuva Ring, <clears throat> you know, that it's still, you know, if you have any increased risk of, of having a stroke or blood clot or any kind of circulatory uh, problems, you can't take it. Or if you do, you have to be prepared that you may die as a result. And that's for pretty much all hormonal birth control for women. So, yeah. I mean, I, I find it interesting that I find it interesting that they did stop the study, given that those are already <laughs> acceptable, no acceptable consequences. Yeah, acceptable risks you know? for women, but <clears throat> yeah. not so mm -hmm. much for men. Seventy five percent of the men wanted to continue using the shot, according to the press release from the study. Mm -hmm. Quote, despite no. <laughs> Despite the higher than expected number of adverse events, many participants participants expressed their satisfaction with the method and indicated that their partners were relieved that they did not have to bear the burden of contraception themselves. So, yes, it's it's still something that we need. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out, too, that mm -hmm. um, I forgot about this. I just glanced at the article again. One of the most commonly reported adverse side effects was pain at the injection site. And I was like, yeah, it, uh -huh. is it? Did it take? <laughs> like, it, yeah? <laughs> it's a, that's a needle. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's an injection. It's going to be a little sore, you know. Yeah, but about that, I'm also, you know, you know they, they seen the effects. Do a tetanus shot, too. You know, the big, <laughs> yeah. oh, God, I hate tetanus shots. Or the um, TB test. That one's fun. Oh, yes. You know, I've um, seen the effects of hormonal birth control. That's why I'm a big fan of the non-hormonal birth controls. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. which one... One is male, and I am still waiting for it to come out, and they are slowly going with the test. I put a link for this in the uh, in the notes under this for Vassal Gel, mm -hmm. yeah. which is something I've been following since it was in India 15 years ago. And, you know, they've this Parsimonious Foundation is bringing it over here. They've done they've already done some animal trials. They're going to hopefully start doing human clinical trials here before the end of the year, maybe the beginning of next year. But it is beautiful, multi-year long capable, non-hormonal, and is... Unlike almost every other type of birth control out there, one hundred percent effective. Wow! Wow! So what's holding it up? Yeah, it's like why are we bothering with other things then? The <laughs> money, the uh, they, patriarchy. They, 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 <laughs> actually, yeah, a lot of it, primarily, primarily, yeah, it's, they don't they have ahead. the funding. Hmm. They they are mostly funded due to small time donors. Um, you know private people donating what they can. They don't have like this really big, just huge amount of money to throw at it. And of course, if you get a long-lasting non-hormonal contraceptive, uh, you're essentially, you know, taking out the market for most other types of contraceptives that are out there for men. And in truth, and the way they would look at it, also for women, because if, hey, if, I, if we're in a relationship and I've got this thing on me and it's good for five years... Why do you need to get anything? We're good. Mama Van, in the, chat room, some other Mama Van in the chat room says that no doctor will give birth control to any woman over 35 that is a smoker. I think that's baloney because I know a lot of women that smoke that are over that age and are on birth control. It depends on, on you self-reporting, to be honest. If you mm. tell your, your doctor will ask you, like, do you smoke? And you have the opportunity to lie. Um, if, if you are ready to accept the risk of having uh, an increased risk of stroke 
or heart attack because you're adding that on top of uh, the smoking. But if you tell them yeah. yes. Well, speaking of that, just to uh, just to forward the conversation a little bit, um, apparently an article out in New Scientist, another study, every 50 cigarettes smoked causes one DNA mutation per lung cell. Yeah, but I is saw it the that. awesome mutation? Or is it I, the crap I, mutation? It's probably it's the crap the, mutations. Because we don't have a Hulk. <clears throat> well, it's not Gamma. I mean, come on, you know. If you're um, smoking gamma ray cigarettes, oh, you've got a nasty habit. You're uh, a <laughs> you're you're a, a stronger person than I am. Ooh. That's for sure. On average, there is one DNA per mutation per lung cell for every si fifty cigarettes smoked, according to the new analysis. Uh, people who smoke a pack of twenty a day for a year generate one hundred and fifty mutations per lung cell, ninety-seven per larynx cell. 39 per pharynx cell, 18 per bladder cell, and 6 per liver cell. Epidemiological studies previously linked to tobacco smoking with at least 17 classes of cancer, but this is the first time researchers have been able to quantify the molecular damage inflicted on DNA. That's yeah, insane. you're, you're yeah. really screwing yourself up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, your liver. Cells in your liver are being changed. Do they describe in what way they're being changed? That's what I was wondering, too. Well, let's see here. Um, theoretically, every DNA mutation has the potential to trigger a cascade of genetic damage that causes cells to become cancerous. However, we still don't know what the probability is of a single smoking-related DNA mutation turning into cancer, or which mutation types are likely to be more malignant. This is research we are currently pursuing. Uh, so they're likening it to kind of a Russian roulette thing. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Where, yes, it's, it's causing more DNA mutations than normal. And okay. when your DNA is not transcribed properly there is always the chance that it could then replicate out of control and become cancerous. Mm -hmm. We had a Facebook comment that says, wonder what the mutation rate is on partial secondhand smoke. Partial secondhand smoke. Wow. Um, I, I don't think that's that in would there, be but it is an interesting question. Yeah, that would be really hard to figure out because that's not something that you were, could really study because these are willing participants that would be in the study mm -hmm. that are smokers you don't really have willing secondhand smokers no i mean sure there's a niche for everybody but i don't <laughs> think that you know that's that's not really something that would be easily uh tested well no uh, but i mean if if we can find out you know uh for example the fact that we know that secondhand smoke yeah. is harmful and does cause all these other things right which we, we have, could probably yeah. yeah we could probably find out um, it's through probably, another type of methodology. It's probably an extrapolation. Yeah. So probably whatever... Uh, though it would be a, a very diffuse... I don't know. I don't know. That's going to be one of those things. There is probably damage, but figuring out how bad it is is, you know, really, really difficult, difficult to figure out. Now, once we get nanites and they're <laughs> swimming through your blood... They'll tell you everything you need to know. So there you go. Yeah, penny for NASA. At that point, it won't matter. <laughs> yeah, penny for NASA because yeah. they'll they'll wipe you wipe you clean and everything will be fine. Um, quitting smoking will not reverse these mutations. By the way, they leave permanent scars on DNA, but it will prevent added risk of more mutations. So, the earlier you quit smoking, the healthier you'll be down line. Weird. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Fun stuff, fun stuff. So you can find these links in our in our show notes out at uh, O'Reilly Radio Show One Thirty One B. And uh, let's see, we got a couple more uh, more really hard science ones that we're just going to briefly touch on because um, they're hard. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the impossible particle. Japanese physicists say they've found the tetra neutron. A tetra neutron. Now, Stephen, you you found this uh, 
you found actually both of these, and I've I've just linked them back in. So, uh, what is what is your take uh, on, well, on again, the it, tetra neutron? Well, okay, partly I just goes okay. This looks really freaking cool, and as we're Absolutely. following all the stuff about science coming out, going hey, this is stuff that could literally change everything, especially when it's the oh yeah, this thing doesn't exist, and some scientist goes yeah, it does. Oh, um, we we found it over here. We just didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it is. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. It's but a hypothetical particle. It's um, a particle that contains four neutrons, but no proton. And technically speaking, the way we understand science, it shouldn't exist. Yeah, I was just thinking four neutrons, but no proton. Yeah. So how is it held together? It must be terribly well, yeah. unstable. Uh, let's see. Again, it might be they say in here, you know, a, theoretically, a no proton the particle of themed low neutrons. Impossible. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so theoretically, the instability of a lone neutron of lone neutrons makes this particle impossible. In fact, a 1965 paper had previously concluded that there was no evidence that could be found to confirm the existence of a tetraneutron. Uh, many separate studies followed, reporting experimental observations of the fabled particle. However, to date, no, we have no solid evidence. So now it seems that this impossibility wasn't enough to stop Japanese researchers from seeing the particle signature while conducting recent experiments, or at least that's what they think their experiments revealed. So we've got uh, Peter Shuck of France's National Center for Scientific Research told Science News that it confirmed, quote, it would be something of a sensation uh, if confirmed. Uh, ultimately, when and if the results are independently replicated by other teams, this confirmation of the existence of the elusive tetraneutron would warrant serious changes in our understanding of nuclear forces. And you know we're we're pretty uh, we're pretty solid on those those nuclear forces that hold everything <laughs> together. We're we're pretty solid on those. Now that it's when we go past those forces into the like you know quarks and well no we it's the quarks that are those fundamental properties. So it, it's when we get into the um, uh, the bosons, yeah, you know, or the Higgs boson and things like that. That's where mm -hmm. things get fuzzy in the quantum foam of the universe. But this is this is weird. I'd I'd never even thought that that would be something that it's an impossible idea that I never would have asked. This reminds me of the time crystals that they think they may have found um, back in September, and it was just time like, crystals. Uh, um, and it was like people don't think that these exist, but uh, we may have found them. But they defy everything that we know about uh, the laws of nature. Well, this was on Octo <laughs> October 4th. So this is just, just last month. Physicists create world's first time crystals. Time crystals were first predicted in 2012. Researchers have created time crystals for the first time and say they could one day be used as quantum memories. How did this mm -hmm. escape me? Amber, thank you for being on the show. Wow. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's. Uh, okay. I'll just copy and we'll put that in the show notes for later. Wait, am, am I hearing a uh, memory insert? Uh, quantum memory. Quantum memory. I'm not Close sure enough. what that means. Uh, quantum memories. So, uh, crystals are extraordinary objects. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. Uh, get to the good part. <laughs> uh, Laws of physics are spatially symmetrical, but crystals are not. They're uh, asymmetrical. It's a phenomenon known as symmetry breaking. It comes, okay. Oh boy. And then there's charts, lots of charts. That's nice. Mm. Um, okay, so if time symmetry were broken, then the ring could vary periodically in time. In other words, it would rotate. Of course, it would never be possible to extract energy from this motion that would violate the conservation of energy, but the temporal symmetry breaking would manifest itself in the repeating motion in time, just as a spatial symmetry breaking manifests itself as repeating patterns in space. Okay. Yeah, so if, if you think about... I, I am. I'm thinking about it. I don't know. <laughs> well, if you think of it like <laughs> dropping something on the floor... So lots of things, when they, they would fall down on one side or the other when you drop them. Mm -hmm. And the way that a time crystal, or, or I'm sorry, um, 
back to the things that that norm that act quote unquote normal. Yeah. When they they Newtonian fall, physics, yeah. the way that they fall is either called a resting or a ground state. And then by figuring out what makes these things fall on one side or the other, that can help you learn more about the object as well as the floor. Um, right. And then sometimes things don't literally fall, but they still have ground states like magnets, which will pick one side to be north and the other side to be south, and that's their ground state. Um, but crystals have asymmetrical ground states. So as a crystal reaches its ground state, it always has some bits that are pointy and some bits that are smooth. And it's not the same on all sides, um, which is kind of similar to the magnets. Mm -hmm. um, but hmm. you, normally you would have to give something some energy to make it move or change their ground state. Um, that's not necessarily true with time crystals. Wow. Okay. This is heavy. And the reason that's interesting is because um, a, a time crystal to us, it would look like they're moving in their ground state, but they're doing so without any extra energy. So like if you dropped a die on the ground, but mm -hmm. instead of landing on the side, it landed on the corner and just spun forever. That's what mm -hmm. a time crystal would do, essentially. Wow. For applications, Monroe and company uh, make a, f a couple of suggestions. They say, for example, that time crystals could be used for quantum information tasks, such as implementing a robust quantum memory. But the exotic nature of many body localization and the fact that it is still poorly understood may mean that other physicists will want to check out the nature of this effect carefully before confirming that it really shows the existence of time crystals. Ooh. So the uh, the reference for this is um, uh, arvix.org abs uh, 1609.08684 observation of a discrete time crystal. I think that will also be the title of my memoirs. <laughs> I think I like that. That is some neat stuff. And while we're talking about crystals, let's talk about lasers too. So. <clears throat> So some uh, some very clever people out at um, let's see which uh, Rochester's University Laboratory of Laser Energetics, which is always fun, um, they have been working on the Omega Laser, which is apparently uh, could yield fusion five times higher than the current record. Extremely. Uh Laser fusion is a thing that we work with and mess with. The current standard method is essentially what is known as an indirect method, mm -hmm. where it's a lot more lasers. They use about 192 of them, but they fire them in a crisscross pattern inside of a golden closure, which then converts the lasers into x-rays, and the x-rays then slam into the shell and compress the core, thus causing you know microfusion. Uh, what the Omega laser yeah. does is it's that it now has between the lasers and computer systems running and everything else can now generate precise hits all around the object. So as they say in this release, imagine a balloon, but it is being compressed equally on all sides at the exact same time. Which of course that means it doesn't pop; it then compresses yeah. correctly which is what they're doing here with the 60 lasers. They are able to do it correctly and compress the whole thing to roughly the size of a tenth of a millimeter triggering ignition. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Nice. So essentially so a more efficient, a, uh, more efficient fusion. Yeah, the very bottom it says, you know, in laser fusion, an ignited target is like a miniature star of about a tenth of a millimeter, which produces the energy... Energy equivalent of a few gallons of gasoline over a fraction of a billionth of a second. Which mm. is not an insignificant yeah. amount of energy. Not for something that small. I mean, the energy density there is uh, is very high. Of course, you're also putting a lot of energy into it to get to that point. So we're mm -hmm. trying to put it put in enough energy so that it can cascade to make more energy than is put in. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's the whole the whole theory here behind fusion. Well, lots of stuff we've seen about fusion and plasmas and everything else, it's that initial kick 
to get it to become a plasma mm-hmm. infusion takes a lot of energy. But once it's there, the amount of energy required to sustain that is incredibly small. It takes yeah. the bigger problem at this point is containment and fuel. <laughs> Right. Those are our two main problems we've been having with fusion for the last, you know, 10, 15 years is we're having problems either A, just injecting enough fuel to keep the thing going, and B, having a problem with these high energy particles not, you know, burning a hole through the reactor shell. That'd be a good thing. Yeah, we don't we don't mm-hmm. want uh, we don't want fusion core leaks. That'd be bad. <laughs> I guess that would not happen. It's no. better fission though. Yeah. So there's I... a bright white flash of heat and done. Well, I I, th- I think I've seen that on Star Trek though. It, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. <laughs> Core's explosion and things like that all the time. Core breach. Core breach. No, eject the core. All right. And that will uh, conclude our science segment. Now let's. Uh, unless we have anything else that we need to add to that. We covered a lot. And then some. I'm. That's awesome. Pretty science full right now. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're you're full of science. For now. Okay, okay, all right. 